On August 18, 1996, WWE presented its ninth SummerSlam from Cleveland, Ohio. The show is both famous and infamous for its two main events, and an otherwise poor card. The rivalry between WWE and WCW was getting hotter, as the NWO had formed one month earlier at Bash at the Beach. On the WWE side, Shawn Michaels had been champion since WrestleMania, and Steve Austin had won the King of the Ring two months prior. The future Stone Cold didn't make it onto the SummerSlam card, but he defeated Yokozuna in a two minute dark match before the event went on the air. The NWO's rise was beginning to put WWE on the back foot, but at this time they were building stars for the future, like Austin and Mick Foley. Another notable future star is Hunter Hearst Helmsley, who had been scheduled to win the King of the Ring that year until the curtain call incident in Madison Square Garden happened. Triple H isn't on this card, presumably still being punished. The undercard included two matches that were rated duds or zero stars by the Wrestling Observer. A poor tag title match where the Smoking Guns beat the Godwins, the Body Donners and the New Rockers, don't ask and Jerry Lawler would defeat Jake Roberts. Roberts and Lawler were involved in a terrible storyline where Jerry was making fun of Jake's substance abuse issues, even coming to the ring carrying what he called Jake's tag partners, Jim Bean and Jack Daniels. The only silver lining is that we were introduced for the first time to Mark Henry, who had recently signed with WWE. Henry would make his in-ring debut and his second ever match against Lawler at Mind Games the following month. If you're wondering, his first match was at House Show with Lawler one night before the pay-per-view. In the semi-main event, The Undertaker and Mankind battled in the first ever Boiler Room Brawl. At WrestleMania 12 earlier in the year, WWE had experimented with a match mostly taking place backstage, ending in the ring. The Hollywood Backlot Brawl between Rowdy Roddy Piper and Goldust. That match was abnormally violent for the time, still being in the New Generation era, but was considered a highlight along with Shawn Michaels vs Bret Hart in the main event on an otherwise lacklustre WrestleMania. The day after WrestleMania 12, Mankind made his WWE debut. With his bizarre look and the unique way he carried himself, Mankind made short work of Bob Holly and calmed himself to the tune of soft piano music post-match. He was quickly thrown into a feud with The Undertaker, during which he would often run away from the dead man, but there would be nowhere to run in the boiler room. The rules of the match would differ from later boiler room brawls. After this one, you would win by being the first to escape the room, but this time, the two would battle towards ringside, and the winner would be the man who retrieved the symbolic urn from Paul Bearer standing in the ring. This sounds slightly unfair towards The Undertaker, but more on that later. For the boiler room segments, the crowd were provided with small televisions that were wheeled onto ringside, meaning that if you were further back than the third row, or couldn't see the entrance screen, you had no chance of knowing what was going on. This was a few years before the giant titantron made matches like this easier for the live crowd to see. The match begins with us following Undertaker into the boiler room, and we're told Mankind is already there waiting. According to the Wrestling Observer, the boiler room part of the match was filmed the day before, making this among the first cinematic matches. After a few minutes of Taker looking for him, Mankind attacks from behind. What follows is a very slow walk and brawl, with Mankind squealing like a pig after every blow. There are a few moments where static is edited in, and Vince McMahon on commentary explains that the transmission from the boiler room is poor, but these are likely to cover breaks between takes. After what feels like an eternity of slow brawling, Mankind climbs a ladder, but Undertaker sits up before he can jump off it. Taker pulls the ladder from the wall, causing Mankind to crash through a strategically placed box. The most exciting point of the match so far. From here, both leave the boiler room, 
with the other wrestlers cheering Taker on in the corridor as he follows Mankind. Mankind throws whatever he can grab to slow the Undertaker down, including a vat of coffee. Slow him down even more, I mean. Near the end of this 26 minute fight, Undertaker and Mankind made their way to the ring. The two struggle to enter the ring, but when Undertaker eventually does, he asks for his manager to present him with the urn. Paul Bearer, however, refuses to hand it over. This allowed Mankind to recover and knock Undertaker out with the mandible claw. Paul Bearer strikes the final blow, hitting his former client with the urn and hands it, along with the match, to Mankind. Paul Bearer had betrayed the Undertaker and gone to the dark side. Undertaker lay motionless in the ring until he was carried away by druids. On Raw the following night, Jim Ross interviewed Paul Bearer and Mankind in the ring. Bearer explained that he had carried the Undertaker for six years, but before he could say much more, the lights would flicker. Paul was clearly rattled by this. The Undertaker would make his return, carried in by the Druids just as he left SummerSlam, and sitting up in his Jason Voorhees inspired way. He scared Bearer and Mankind away by sending fire out of the ring posts, much like his brother Kane would do in his arrival a year later. Mankind would make a challenge to Shawn Michaels for a match at the next pay-per-view, Mind Games. But would Shawn still be champion by then? In the main event, Vader would challenge Shawn Michaels for the WWE Championship. Shawn had won the title at WrestleMania 12 and defended it against the likes of Diesel and Camp Cornet member British Bulldog on pay-per-view. Cornet wasn't done with Shawn Michaels, however so he set another of his stable after the WWE Champion. Shawn and Vader had the best match of the night by far. Shawn Michaels seemed to have a special talent for having amazing matches with much larger opponents. From this to his many battles with the likes of Sid, The Undertaker and many more. And this would be another. At the opening bell there's very little wrestling, just a wild brawl. Within minutes the action spills to the outside and Sean takes the opportunity to dive at Vader. He's still the heartbreak kid. He's still a flashy showman, but he's more aggressive than we would normally see him. At the near 15 minute mark, Vader actually wins this match by count out, having dropped Michaels over the guardrail. Upon realizing Vader can't win the title this way, his manager Jim Cornette takes the microphone and demands that the match be restarted. Sean could have walked away still the champion, a la Yokozuna at SummerSlam 94. But against his manager Jose Lothario's wishes, HBK heads back to the ring. When it looks like Sean will win this time, Cornette throws in his trademark tennis racket, only for Sean to catch it and go mad with it, attacking Vader and Cornette. No wonder he hates Sean so much. Vader now wins for the second time, thanks to Sean getting disqualified, but again doesn't get the championship for a DQ. Cornette once again gets on the microphone and lures Sean into agreeing to restart the match again. Vader hits a powerbomb and earns a visual pinfall, but the referee was down and unable to count, so Vader could have won three times now. Eventually, Shawn Michaels hits a moonsault off the top and he manages to hold on and pin Vader. This near 30 minute match is one I recommend you go and watch, but there is a dark backstory to it. Despite the two having many house show matches in the lead up to SummerSlam, Sean and Vader just couldn't seem to get along. The false finishes and restarts were supposed to lead to a rematch, where Sean would lose the title to Vader at Survivor Series and then win it back at the 1997 Royal Rumble, which would take place in Sean's adopted hometown, San Antonio, Texas. Sean originally being from Arizona, but moved around a lot because of his father's military career, before eventually settling in Texas. Vince's plan was to use the long-term booking 
to build an absolute monster for Shawn Michaels to slay in front of the biggest crowd possible that would be completely behind the Heartbreak Kid. Because of the heat that had built between the two that peaked at SummerSlam, the plan was changed and Sid would become the one to dethrone Michaels and then lose to him at the Alamo Dome. You can pinpoint the exact moment that those plans change, around 12 minutes into the match. Shawn Michaels climbs to the top rope to hit his trademark elbow drop, but instead of hitting the elbow, Shawn lands on his feet and proceeds to yell, MOVE at Vader. The plan spot was for Shawn to go for the elbow and for Vader to roll out of the way, but he didn't, and Michaels lost his cool yelling at Vader and kicking him in the head twice. In his autobiography years later, Sean would admit his wrongdoing in this moment, but this was just the last of many incidents. After Vader's WWE release in 1998, he would talk in interviews about his legendarily stiff style never truly fitting in the WWE. He would also talk about one top of the card wrestler in particular, who would often threaten to get him fired for being too stiff. He didn't name that wrestler, but it would later become clear that he was talking about Shawn Michaels. Vader's stiff in-ring style was well known through the business, and occasionally wrestlers would fight back. One such match is a classic between himself and Ric Flair at WCW's 1993 Starcade. The story goes that Flair's manager, Harley Race, whispered to Flair at ringside that he needs to fight back, and Flair did, making for an epic match, and one I can't wait to talk about when we get to December. Thank you for watching yet another wrestling channel, if you enjoyed this please comment, like or subscribe.